All right, I'm recording on here. The only thing I'm going to do, Mike, is just read and pronounce your last name. Is it Scholz or Schultz? Scholz. Scholz. Okay. The only yep. thing I'm going to do is um, is uh, is just read the intro that I wrote, but then we're just going to have a conversation beyond that. All right. Cool. All right. All right here we go. In three seconds, let me just give my team three seconds of dead air so they know where to start the editing process. Here we go, Mike. All right. Here we go. In three. All right, Ford Mustang community. If you want your classic Mustang to look like it just rolled off the assembly line, today is the day to tune in. So Mike Scholz, he, he has done that, and he's here to share some hacks, maybe some tricks, maybe some tactics. And before I even hit record, we started talking immediately about all you guys on the Instagram community and those that are also in our Ford Mustang uh, classic car, connect, classic Mustang connection uh, Facebook group also. And wherever you guys are in our community, we just so very much, I do, I know Mike does also so very much appreciate you. So Mike has fixed up his Boss 302 to look like it's showroom new. And I'm excited to talk to him about what he has done and what he's about to do to his boss. Mike, I'm excited to talk to you. Welcome to Ford Mustang, the Early Years Podcast. Thank you. I, I thank you. I'm I'm happy you're here, man. <laughs> hey, so so let's start. I want to go right back to where I where we were before I hit record on this thing. And and you were so kind to say, well, well, you know, what I have helped with is in terms of just trying to build this community. It hasn't been me. I've just been the catalyst for some of this stuff. The community is there, and they just want to talk so much. So let's talk about this this amazing community for just a moment. If if you would start, that would be great, and then we'll keep going from there. Sure. The the neat thing about the Mustang community is you can have two people with Mustangs that have never met each other, even from different cities or different states, and they have some, something in common, and they we merely strike up a conversation, and we talk about the cars. And the community is so willing to help. It doesn't matter what state they're in, who you call, what show you go to, what event. Everybody's willing to help you out. They help you find the parts you need. They help you with uh, questions or they help you with answers to your questions. It's really, it's it's a close-knit community. And your podcast, I'm just excited having this because your podcast is further bringing us all together. People from all over the world. Yeah. Um, you know, 70,000 people. I heard you say on one of your podcasts, um, you're going to keep going to 100,000. I hope you don't stop at 100,000. I hope you keep going after that. I remember when I had 2,500 and um, I had joined and one of the first guys I had met, two guys, I met Brad Newman and uh, Guido Lucido and had conversations with both of these guys. And exactly what you said, we both have, all three of us have uh, 65 Mustangs and we started, sw uh, and um, uh, let's see, Brad's got a coupe um anthony uh, uh guido's got a um a fastback and i have a convertible but they all have basically the same innards you know so we're talking about the 289 engine and i'm you know i'm so not mechanical and these guys are both like can swim circles around me and turn wrenches so much better than i can but they took the time to share like some of the things that they have done whether it's Hey, tell me about if I want to get this this heater working, or tell me if I want to replace the instrument cluster inside the you know inside the um, inside the car itself in the interior. How do I do these things? They both have taken so much time. And Guido and I had even like gone to an event together, which is, I mean, like you said, you can meet anywhere in the world. These three happen to us three happen to be in California, but. Uh, it is so, so very amazing. Uh, maybe you can share, like, uh, do you have any kind of community stories like that that you could share, like guys or women that you have met through the course of you owning your car? Well, it's it's just amazing. Um, I went out to the Mustang Nationals at the end of July and met my daughter there. And it was our first Mustang Nationals we've been to. And she apparently talked to some people uh, at the Mustang Nationals that I didn't know she talked to him. And so then I was at the Mustangs on the Mississippi show at the end of August, and a couple from Iowa came up to me and said, oh, is your daughter the one that's going to Cornell University? And I said, yeah, that's her. <laughs> and, he, and he said, we were talking to her. What a wonderful, wonderful student and person she was. And, you know, nice. we're states and states apart and just people that I never even met, we had someone in common. Uh, and then and Mustangs in the Mississippi. Okay, I invited my sister to go with me uh, to that. It was a three-day event. Uh, we had uh, about 190 Mustangs. And I invited my sister to go with. And here she knew more people mm. at that show than, than I did. And I'm the one with the Mustang. <laughs> that's, that's, really, that's really funny. Well, why don't you, where in the country are you located? I'm located in Minnesota. 
and um, I have had five Mustangs. My first Mustang I purchased when my brother went off to school, went off to college. I bought it from, he and I differ on the amount, but it was either $750 or $950. It was a 69 Mach 1, 428 Super Cobra Jet, four-speed car, drag pack. It's like everybody's dream car. Yeah, yeah. And um, it had he had just painted it uh, and it had a worn out engine. And so I got it for a really good price. Then I built it into a drag car. And this was my first, it was my second drag car. And I drag raced all over the, the Midwest area. I love the car. It was my favorite car. Um, I even, my claim to shame, I sh- should even say this on, <laughs> my claim to shame was I raced in the very first uh, Quaker State North Star Nationals, NHRA Nationals at Brainerd National Raceway, uh, 1982, I believe it was. And I shut the track down on national TV. I blew my motor, shut the track down. Oh my gosh. But but the people there, it was so, so helpful, Sony. Um, Shirley Muldooney was parked next to me. I was there with my my girlfriend at the time and I had an open trailer with a box of tools um, racing. And she's right next to us in this great big massive rig. And across from us was uh, Lee Shepard. Uh, and he actually, won, I think he and Shirley both won that year. It was just awesome how friendly these people were, how helpful they were. And that just carries on, you know, to now. I mean, everybody yeah. from the Mustang community helps everybody else out. What it's, I, it's so what I love, what I love about about not just what you're saying, but how you're saying it, Mike. It's it's obvious to hear your level of enthusiasm for not only the car but for the the community itself. So it sounds like from from your early experiences, uh, early 80s, maybe even the 70s, it sounds like you have some pretty deep experience within the industry itself. So have you always been in the industry or do you, is it just always been a hobby of yours? Tell me about your involvement. Well, so my first car was a 62 Ford Fairlane two-door sport coupe. And uh, I turned that into a, a street racing car and you're a guy that's looking for trouble <laughs> at every street light you're looking for trouble he's he's driving a 78 chevette and he is still looking for trouble at the, tra- at the traffic light i have a feeling <laughs> so i remember i got pulled over for street racing a number of times one summer and my father said i'll pay your entry fee if you go take that to the strip sometime i thought wow really so i took it to a, a drag strip local here called north star dragways and got my butt kicked, mm-hmm. went home, immediately took that thing apart and started building it to go faster because uh, it just wasn't fast enough. And I just, I, I just started dating this girl and um, she um, wanted to do something, go out. Or, and I said, no, nah, I'm going to work on my, my Mustang. I'm turning my, my Mustang into a drag car. And she says, well, can I help? So she comes over and she's helping me work on this Mustang. I'm putting headers on the driver's side. She's putting the headers on the passenger side. I'm I'm hoping you didn't let her go. I'm hoping you married her. (laughs) You know, it was, it was like, wow, this girl's helping me do this, you know, build this car. And so that it got late that night and I, I needed to take her back to her dorm. I said, just take the 62 Fairlane. So she took the 62 Fairlane back to the dorm. And sometime after midnight that night, the phone rings. And she said, the rear end's locked up on the, on the car. I said, what happened? She said, well, some guy in a tea bucket pulled up next to me and wanted to drag race. And when I dumped the clutch, the rear end broke. I'm thinking, man, this girl's a keeper. <laughs> well, totally. 40 years later, we're still married. Ah, there you go. <laughs> well, wait, did you share what kind of Mustang that was? <laughs> so that was that was my 62 Fairlane at that point. Oh, you said Mustang. I'm sorry. Maybe I, I maybe was, I misunderstood. You were talking about the Fairlane, your 62. Yes. Okay. Yeah. As right. I was working on the Mustang I was working on for drag racing, that was my got 69. It. Okay. So you okay, you got the 69 and then t- take me through yep. the the uh, the lineage of your uh, you know, your 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 Mustang collection that you've had over the years. Okay. So I I had that 69, that was my drag car. And then my wife and I, we uh, just bought our first house and we were trading every two hours, getting up and changing the, the buckets on the attic because of the roof leaks so bad. That next morning I said, I got to sell the Mustang. She goes, mm. no, don't you regret it. Well, she's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I regretted it. And I've tried for many, many years to track it down. I tracked it through eight different owners and then it's disappeared. 
Mm. Um, but I still got my name out there and the VIN number. Next Mustang. Um, so then I got, you know, my daughters and started raising girls. And, and I thought, I want to secretly restore a Mustang for my daughter's graduation present. Wow. Secretly. So that's, a, that's a hard put, secret to keep. It is really hard. So I put the feelers out and um, my sister-in-law in Colorado said that her pastor's daughter who lived in California um, has a Mustang and she was looking to sell it to get something more modern. So I pretty much bought it sight unseen and uh, had it shipped up to Minnesota. Um, it was multicolored. The top was torn. It was a 69, 69 Mustang also, a coupe. Um, it was the color had been changed. So I rebuilt it. I restored it at a friend's shop. And then I sent it to a local paint shop where they painted it. And then I decided I was, it was ready to give it to her for a present. So the fun thing was, is I told her that um, grandma was meeting us for dinner at uh, a local restaurant. And so we're driving to the restaurant. She looks across the street and she says, hey, there's a car show. Can we go, Dad? And I said, well, we'll see after we're, after we're done eating. Well, I had secretly stopped and dropped the car off at the car show before. <laughs> and so well, we had good. dinner. That's good you had a daughter that was that would have ever asked that question. My daughter would have seen the car show and said, hey, can we go to eat somewhere else? I don't want to be disturbed by the cars. <laughs> that's pretty well, good. And both my daughters, anytime we go to car show, they scan the show to see where the 69 Mustangs were because they knew that's what dad liked. Right, right. And so um, during the during lunch, while we're eating, it downpoured. The guys at the car show knew I was giving the car to my daughter. So they took and they dried it all off. They polished the whole thing down. So when we came after lunch, they all stood way back. And my daughters each walked to a each picked out a 69 Mustang. Well, my youngest daughter, she walked to the one that was going to her sister and she saw the name on the windshield. And so then she says, oh my gosh. And then she does this zip lip thing, you know, I'm thinking, oh no. Well, my oldest daughter, she decides she's not going to go look at that car because her sister already looked at that one. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Sherry, just go take a look and see what name is on the, on it. And I'll see what size engine it has. So she looks at it and she says, oh, Someone's got the same name as her. <laughs> <laughs> now, was that a, a Boss 429 also? Nope. That was a, that was a standard 302. Got it. 69 got it. Coupe 302. And um, so then she turns around and sees the whole place standing in a big semicircle. Um, my mother's videotaping it. And uh, she says, really? And I hand her the keys. And, you know, she, and she screams. And then they were... They're really nice at the car show. They gave her a trophy, even though it wasn't the nicest car at the show. Um, so that was kind of neat. But the best thing, my, my fondest memory of her getting her car was the next day when she brought it to school. I get a phone call from the owner of the pizza shop at about three o'clock. And he says, I think you should know a pretty little blonde just lit the tires up for a group of boys in front of my shop. <laughs> <laughs> proud papa i i told my wife and she goes how are you going to keep a straight face because i'm thinking yeah <laughs> that what a great what a great mustang story i'm sure it's one that your your daughter the the uh the recip the recipient of the gift now how do you give one to one and not the other so then if the next girl is my next daughter my youngest daughter she thought that the car that i was restoring was for me and so she figured I didn't have, you know, enough funds to get one for her. And so then she didn't even know about it at first. And then I called her, her prom date up, or called her prom date's father up first. And I said, is it okay if your son picks my daughter up in uh, my Mustang? And this is a 69 Fastback with a 351 Windsor. Mm -hmm. And the boy said, no, we're going to drive the bus. <laughs> and I, his dad said, um, I'll pick her up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. I'll volunteer to fill so that. I told him, I said, aren't you going to go out for dinner? He says, yeah. I said, okay, why don't you pick her up in this car? So he picked her up. And when they came driving into the, the school parking lot, he was driving so slow and so quietly. Um, when he walked out of the car, my wife said, you know, that's a muscle car. We want to hear it. When you leave, we want to hear that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> 
So, so is this the second Mustang? So you had a, a, a 302 that you gave to your, your oldest daughter and you gave a, uh, you gave the 351 Windsor to your youngest daughter. So tell me, tell me they still have both of these cars. They still have both these cars. Oh, my oldest good. daughter, my oldest daughter, um, she kept such good care of that car. Um, she even used it for her power mechanics class. Um, did a, a PowerPoint presentation of how she rebuilt the carburetor for it. And, and she really is sharp gal. She knows all about the cars. My daughters, I don't have any sons. So my daughters love their firearms. They love their muscle cars and they love their horses. Oh my so. gosh. I love it. And, and is it just, the, just the two of them? Two girls. Two, two girls. And, and it, it sounds like your wife is still into vehicles also. Yep. My wife likes muscle cars too. Um, she keeps telling me that the boss is too quiet. She wants it louder, but I made it stock. I put it back the, the way that came from the factory. And then she knows that when I finish the car I have on a rotisserie right now, that it'll be her turn to get a car. Sadly to say, she wants a Camaro. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Where did, where, did, where did we go wrong, Mike? Where did we go wrong? Your whole family. Well, you know, she probably has some connection. You know, my my sister, my stepsister had a, um, a uh, I think a, a 72 Camaro, I want to say, something like that. And she's always had this affinity to uh, towards Camaros. I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Finally, I get the, the classic Mustang that I want, the 65 convertible. And uh, you can't tell me you still want that, that Camaro, but I'm sure she, I'm sure she does. So I, I understand. I understand from personal experience. I know what that's like. So then it was my turn to get a car for me. And I found this 67 um, GT fastback, four speed V8. Wow. Really a nice car. It had been sitting under a tarp for 15 plus years. And a friend of mine called and said, you know, I think that's a Mustang behind that house under a tarp. So I went over there, knocked on the door, and they said um, they were just renters. And they gave me the name of the owner of the house. And he was down in California. And I called him up and he said, yeah, I bought the house. Um, it was a drug seizure and, I, and it came with the house. And I says, okay, if I open up the doors, take a look at it. And he says, sure. And then I found a tab from the very first owner. And so I called him up to get a history on the car. Mm -hmm. And still, there's no title at this point. And um, he said, he says, yep, that was my first car. He said, I ended up selling it to my brother. And just before my brother passed away, he gave it to his son. And uh, I said, great. I said, do you have his, his contact information? He said, well, his son passed away, mm. um, but my other nephew's still alive. So I did some research and I found the other nephew and he didn't want to talk to me. Uh, he said that uh, his, his brother passed away and left all these cars and all this mess for him to take care of. And he just hung up on me. Mm. So then I went out to Washington again and, and uh, knocked on the door and he didn't want anything to do with me. So then I started doing some research and I found out that his mother was still alive and she was um, living in the Philippines. So I called, called his mother up because I want to get actual title now that I own this right. car. Now you're, now you're chasing a title down, <laughs> you know, and I start explaining what I wanted and her son, um, when the house was seized, he lost everything and there were federal warrants out for him. And she says, well, here, why don't you just talk to my son in the Philippines? Oh, I'm he like, had, he had run. <laughs> he had no run. way. <laughs> so this is where it gets really sketchy too, because he had me go to a crack house oh, no. and bring money to people at the crack house to pay for the pay for the car right and it was like i brought my buddy with me and he stood behind me and we didn't go in we did not go in that front door we had nothing to do hey, it the, but, the lanes that we go to to get our mustangs right oh so anyhow i i got it and i had it transported back to minnesota and uh the next day you know the doors were the doors were frozen shut so i had to climb through the window and i I did some mechanical work on it to get it running. And so I was driving us through my pasture 
And my wife accused me of doing Dukes of Hazard because I <laughs> climbed to the window and I'm driving around the pasture. And a guy in a pickup stops. And he says, how much for the 68 GT? And I mm. said, I just got it. It's not for sale. And he said, let me tell you this. He says, everything's for sale. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's not. He says, just tell me a price. I told him a stupid price. And he said, I'll be back tonight with the cash. Oh my gosh. You actually gave him a, see, that was your first mistake. You gave him, you gave him a price. I, I, I shudder to ask what the, and how many years, how many years ago was that? When was that? So that was probably five years ago. Yeah. And that, and that car is probably somewhere between 70 and a hundred thousand dollars right so, now, even the shell. Well, yeah. It's the prices now have just gone up crazy. It's crazy. I could not afford to buy my own car. I, ha I have now. Okay. Now, so you, it's, you, you led me perfectly into it. So tell me about your, your boss. Tell me about the car that you have right now. Give me some of the specs and, and let's start with the license plate. Let's start there. Okay. So I got, you can't start with license plates. I got to tell you why. First. Got it. All right. So about four years ago, maybe five, I told my wife, I need to get another Mustang. I said, the girls are out of the house. I need to get another. No, I said, I need to get a motorcycle first. And then she said, no. And then I told her about three weeks later, I said, I want to get another motorcycle. I haven't had one for so long. I, I quit riding motorcycles when the girls were born. And she says, why don't you just get another Mustang? Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So, <laughs> so I started going to auctions and, um, my daughter and I, we flew up to Canada, to Ontario, to look at a, a 428 Super Cobra jet, and it sounded way too good to be true. And it absolutely was. It was just a basket case. It was not mm. worth anything. Right. Um, I went to Colorado, looked at some in Colorado. I went to auction in Iowa. Then I went to this three-day auction. And if on Friday, this boss went through the auction. I was high bid, but of course the bid went on. And so I didn't get it. So I was home on Sunday. Well, wait, before you say, game. when you say you were high bid, but it, but it didn't go to you. So what's that mean? So I had the high bid, nobody bid higher, but it, the reserve wasn't met. Oh, the reserve wasn't met. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yep. I wasn't sure what you meant. You were high bidder. Normally that means you, you go home with the car, but okay. I got yep. it. Reserve wasn't met. So I was watching a football game on Sunday and I thought, I'm just going to send the auctioneer a, an email and say, how far off was I? Mm -hmm. So I sent an auctioneer an email and he responded right away. He says, call me. So I called him right away. And he said, this guy has run, this guy has sold $2.5 million worth of his cars. And he says, he owes me nothing. Uh, if you want to work a deal out with him, uh, here's his phone number. Wow. What a, what a great business guy. I mean, just, I mean, I mean yeah, he let, left money on the table, but he, he moved enough. He was trying to move another one of his customers' cards, even if it didn't make him any money. And the guy I bought the car from was also a great business guy because he paid the commission anyhow. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I ended up um, picking up the car, rented a trailer, uh, brought the car home, and it was all set up for um, Trans Am racing. Um, all the original parts, well, the, the motor was still the original motor, numbers matching motor, mm -hmm. but everything else had been upgraded for racing. So I um, was going to just, you know, make it into a, a fun car. And I started thinking, maybe I'll restore it to stock condition. All right. At the time, I had no clue the cost of restoring a 69 Boss 302 uh, to original. There's only 1,628 of them made. And the parts, some parts are exclusive to the Boss 302. Um, so anyhow, I started doing research on it. And I found um, a phone number and address for uh, the, the original owner. And so I started trying to call and find, and the, and the number didn't go through, no answer. So I did more research and I found a, a niece who lived up in Alberta and I found a nephew that lived in California and the, the niece didn't answer till after the nephew did. But the nephew said, oh yeah, that's my uncle. Um, let me call him for you. So he called his uncle and, the, and then the uncle called me up and I told him I just bought the car and and, you know, they'd owned the car for over 46 years or some number of years. Right. And 
And then uh, he started talking about the car and give me the history on it and, and how he had um, owned two bosses, a 69 and a 70. And then the, the nephew sent me a photograph of when he was like 10 years old, standing behind the car. And it had that license plate on it that says, yeah. <laughs> and so I thought, what a great license plate. So I had a duplicate license plate made up exactly like the one that was on it when the original owner had it. And so that's on my front license plate. And uh, I think you can see that on my uh, Instagram page. Yeah, I'm looking page. at the picture now. It's it's why a a a a a h h isn't it something like that <laughs> yes <laughs> now so is that is that a real uh real plate or did you say that's a duplicate that's a uh that's like a, a duplicate had made up the uh, so the, the the original owner he has the original plate up on his wall still in his office with some of his trophies so tell me what's what is now again i was reading the the laundry list uh of the things that you have uh that you have put in the car but maybe just give some of the specs so that those in our community that are listening can uh can can water at the mouth so they hear what you're what's inside your car so it's boss 302 um it was the block that was original and in speaking to the original owner he told me that he had swapped the transmissions between the two bosses he owned mm. So it meant I had the wrong transmission. And um, also it had a, a custom carburetor. I found a carburetor from a Corvette owner in Michigan. I found the water pump from a guy in Pennsylvania. I found the, the fuel pump from a guy in Pennsylvania distributor. I found the smog pump from a guy in Florida. I found the heads because it had the set, they had the 70 heads on it. So I found the 69 heads from a guy in Texas. Um, spare tire, uh, jack. Um, I took the dash out and, and had the gauge cluster all rebuilt back to original functioning. It had uh, a pack and some things on the column when I, when I purchased it. I uh, found a radio from a guy in Canada, original AM radio. Um, let's see. There's a lot more, a lot of small so, parts. So would it put, would you now again, cause uh, help me here just because I'm, I'm not as, as well versed in the world of, of Mustang. I, I, I thought I'm, I'm picking up some knowledge with every new guest that I have on the show and, <laughs> and you are a wealth of information. What, what will it take or what would it take to get it to Concours uh, level? Um, is it heading in that direction or it's not something that you'd be able to achieve? So in one of my conversations, I'm almost there. So in one of my conversations with the previous owner, he said, oh, I just found the original air cleaner. And then he also said, and by the way, did you know your Mustang, your boss is on the cover of the first boss registry? And I'm like, no, I didn't. So when I found one on eBay, I bought it. And there inside, sure enough, the VIN number matched. So I knew it was on the cover. But on the inside, it had the VIN number for the other Mustang that he swapped transmissions with. <laughs> so I'd found a guy in California that was the son of the guy that owns it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I found a guy in Florida that was the son of the guy that owns it. And he lives north of Ontario, northern Ontario. And so I called him up and said, hey, I've got your transmission. I verified the VIN number. Do you want to swap them? Swap them because he's got and, yours. You got and his. He said, he said, my English is not very good. Would you send an email? Uh, absolutely. So I sent him an email. It maybe took him five minutes to answer and said, I will pay for everything. Wow. So he paid for the, the swapping out of the transmission, got in the transmission. Um, to make my car totally concourse, I'm very close. I just have the paint jobs to do now. And, um, couple minor things so i entered at the boss nationals and i got so much support and so much information from the other people there one of the judges that judged my car he came and found me afterwards and said how uh impressed he was with how far it's come and you know how concourse correct it is and there's some minor things i still have to do uh, they pointed out that I needed to um, paint one, paint some 
the piece that goes behind the bumper, the, the stone guard there, uh, that was in correct color. And I needed to replace my hood because it wasn't an actual original 69 hood. And this is very minor things. I'm uh, I'm looking left. at pictures of it on uh, on Instagram right now. And by the way, for those in our community that want to take a look at this, you can either type in Mike Schultz, uh, Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-Z, or just type in it's period A underscore boss, and it will uh, it will come up. And it is just a beautiful boss 302. I mean, everything, the color, it's a, it's a, what, what color yellow was that? Is that like it's sunshine called, yellow? <laughs> What's it called? It was called bright yellow. Bright yellow and bright yep. yellow. It, it certainly is. It's a, uh, it's a beautiful car. And I, I'm just amazed with all of the, all of the knowledge, wisdom, experience that you've had in, in getting this up to speed. You know, you could teach me how to make a, uh, a pizza, but you don't ask me to go into the kitchen and actually start mixing flour and egg and water to make it work. Where, where does your, where does your experience actually come from to get you under the hood to make these wrenches go in the way that they go? My father started it all. Uh, he raced first started racing sobs and then on his 40th birthday, he switched and started racing motorcycles. So we always had racing activity sports uh, he took us up to watch the at the races at what's now called bir raceway at then it was called donnybrook um, then i took power mechanics class and my shop teacher was all into racing heavy into racing drag racing uh, all my friends were all car guys and i i built my first first motor uh, in the basement of my house and not many tools, but still did it. I just, you know, you just kind of learn from talking to people. You learn from listening to people. Really, listening is huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I still, I, I use YouTube all the time. There's so much information there. Well, it's I know I, I'm uh, I'm just in the process of doing some carburetor work, which is brand new for me. Carburetor work on this uh, Ford F250 67 pickup that I uh, that I bought. And, you know, I, I've got some buddies that are uh, like uh, Jonathan Campagna, who is, uh, is probably listening to this episode right now and, and thinking he's not, he, he's absolutely immersed deep. And he, he'd probably be sorry for the day that he told me to, <laughs> to uh, hey, I'll help you build it because I don't know how to do anything, but I want to learn. You know, I'm going to change some belts on it. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to not rebuild the carburetor, but, but ch check and fix some of the the um the fuel leaks that are going on in the carburetor i don't want to start an engine fire so i want to make sure it's nice and tight but it is amazing to watch the experience you know to all watch it unfold and like you said at the beginning of the interview to get all of the help that you that you get from people in the community and it is amazing to uh, to receive that kind of support what do you what's your full-time gig are you retired what do you do so i work as a field application engineer and i train people who buy our equipment, companies called Ferro Technologies, and we make uh, measurement equipment, laser equipment. So I'm in all the automotive facilities, I'm in all the aerospace facilities, military facilities, everybody buys it. Uh, Jay Leno uses our equipment, and some, there's some great videos he uses up for doing reverse engineering of parts and then 3D printing them. Wow, wow, and do you ever take your uh, your boss to, uh, to any of your client sites uh, for them to uh, lay their eyeballs on it? No, I haven't done that yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> and how long have you been in that field, Mike? Uh, 20, 24 years. Wow. And, and is your background in engineering? Is it in, is, is that what it's in? Yeah, mechanical engineering. Amazing. Okay. Amazing. Well, I, I so very much appreciate your, your wisdom and, and your, your kindness and your, you know, as I said earlier, your level of enthusiasm is, uh, is, is really what, guided me to you to begin with when I got that I forget whether it was through email or through Instagram that you reached out to me I'm like this guy is just excited about his, the community and his car I have to have him on the show so thank you so much for sharing your uh, your magic with uh, with all of our community today well thank you for having me and thank you for all you do with your show you're it's just great well, you're bringing more people together every day
<laughs> I, I appreciate you and I appreciate the community and Ford Mustang community. Thank you again for sharing all that you do uh, with me and feel free, please, to reach out to me. Just click the link in the show notes or reach out to me directly either at, at Mustang Podcast if you're on Instagram or just send me an email, uh, uh, Doug at turnkeypodcast.com. I'm, I'm a podcast producer full time. But as you all know, this uh, Mustang has been this crazy passion that I've had over the last handful of years, nowhere near as long as, as Mike and a number of our guests. But I am learning a little bit every day, and it's, it's thanks to guys like you. So Ford Mustang community, keep it safe, keep it rolling, and keep it on the road. Until next time, thanks for being here.